they're dead now, the children in the choir and the people in the pews. 913 of them died in Jonestown, November 18, 1978. Do you remember those pictures from the jungle? Did you turn away trying to forget? Or did you ask yourself, who were those people and how were they deceived? I'm a seminary teacher and a pastor. I had to find out for myself, could it have happened to me? Could the people I know and love be deceived? So I went to San Francisco and spent weeks interviewing ex-Temple members, survivors of the massacre, and family and friends of those who died. It was there I learned what I didn't want to know. Joan's victims were our brothers and sisters. They grew up in Christian homes and churches just like yours and mine, and they were deceived. Tim Stone, the second most powerful man in the temple for many years, grew up a born-again Christian in a Baptist home. He attended Sunday school and church faithfully and was a student leader at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Gene Mills, a member of Jones' powerful planning commission, served as a Bible teacher and children's worker in her home church for more than 10 years. Wayne Piedla, a Nazarene, attended Sunday school and church as a child. Bonnie Thielman was the daughter of Assembly of God missionaries to Brazil. Grace Stone, head of Jones' counselors, attended Christian parochial schools for 10 years. Al Mills was chairman of the County Council of Churches Social Action Committee. Daphine Mills attended Sunday school during her early childhood years, but then grew up in People's Temple. And Lena Piedela grew up in a black Pentecostal church. They all came from some kind of religious background. They were looking for something other than what they had in uh, their own religion. Lena said, quote, they were looking for something other than what they had in their own religion, unquote. What was it? They were such a diverse group. 75% were black, 25% were white. Many were poor and uneducated. Others were well-to-do and accomplished. What was it that united them? What was it that caused them to leave their Christian churches and join Jones here at People's Temple? The Christian church I went to as a child was not a friendly church. And I didn't know anybody. You know, I'd go to church and I'd sit by myself. I'd sit there for an hour and then I'd get up and I'd leave. And there was no warmth or uh, nobody to, to make you feel part of the church. Occasionally a person would share a hymnal with me. The greeter might say, hello, how are you? And if I stood in line and waited, the pastor would shake my hand. And that was it. That was all I got. I mean, I knew when I walked out of those doors and walked down the steps that they didn't care and they wouldn't know the difference. One thing I was very impressed with, with People's Temple, when I came there, the first day, you know, people came up to me and they talked to me. When I went into People's Temple, I got hugged. I had people care about me as a human being. They wanted to know my thoughts, my feelings, and nobody had ever cared about that before. They weren't afraid to say, I like you. They all said, please come back. They sent me letters. We hope you'll come back. It wasn't a, a one-day, hi, how are you? My name is so-and-so. Every time you went to the church, people made a point. We, we always had to hug every, you know, during church, Jim would have everybody hug one another. This is where Jim Jones got so many people. He cared about each person individually. Now will each of you give a very fond embrace, a salutary kiss of greeting to your neighbor. And let's fill this atmosphere with warmth and love. I went to a large church in Southern California where there was a black man sitting in a pew. The church was crowded, but no one white would sit with him. And at that point, that was when I decided that I would never go to church again because they were singing songs about flying away to heaven, and I didn't want to go to a heaven where they didn't love a black man. If you belong to a Baptist church, you usually belong to the Baptist church of your own race. You know, you didn't search out 
going to integration and stuff. And that's what a lot of people, a lot of youth saw. You know, they saw Orientals, they saw blacks, they saw whites, they saw uh, um, different races, you know, Indians. They saw all of them all together. And I, when I went to People's Temple, there's people from all different backgrounds in one church getting along together, talking with one another, sitting with one another. And I was really impressed by it. That really touched my heart because to me, that was what life was all about. All of us together. I look down and I see one of our sisters here who's 97 years young and she's now active in one of our self-managing very innovating geriatric home. She cooked, but she was an invalid on her back when she came. And now she cooks because volitionally she wants to. And she's very able. Stand up, Sister Ever. 97 years young. Very few people could cook as good as she does. She cooks wonderful lemon pies. And she's 97 years. And you never ate such lemon pies as she cooks. Thank you, Sister Ever. And I'd always been sort of bothered by the fact that Jesus had talked about to the rich young ruler, sell what you have and give to the poor, and people were driving Cadillacs from the churches. And I mean, I was doing the same thing. If we say we believe in God and do nothing to help anyone or, uh, you know, live a life of greed, then we really don't believe in God. And I guess I had a need to resolve that ambiguity or that paradox. And so that was why I left the church and why I joined People's Temple, because they were doing what everybody else was talking about. Like I was involved in, in uh, setting up with heroin addicts, coming off of heroin. We'd sit with them for, for days until they were completely off of it. They're, they were taking drug addicts and, and uh, putting them through college. Larry Schack, the doctor who uh, administered the cyanide, uh, was one of the people one of the young people that, that uh, Jim Jones had picked up out of, out of the streets and, uh, and educated. And these people, when they would get off of drugs, were the most dedicated people you would find in People's Temple because People's Temple had helped them kick that habit, you know? And they felt that they really owed Jim Jones and People's Temple. I had always loved senior citizens. They had numerous senior citizens, uh, residences where, where black and white people were living together. For example, the care homes that were taken over by People's Temple members were substantially improved as a result of that. There was meat on the tables, whereas there was no meat before. Society's outcasts, some of them who had no social security, were being supported by the temple. One of the ladies who was my favorite lady uh, was named Love Life. She had had cataracts. People's Temple paid for her surgery. We even had accredited teachers that could teach people right in our church. There was a home for retarded children. We had youth projects to, uh, to uh, find people homes in the in Ukiah area. And in the process, I thought that I was really living out the gospel. Not only the concept of, of uh, self-sacrifice in the story of the rich young ruler, but the early church after Pentecost, where they sold what they had and shared what they had in common. And I thought, what an ideal way. Love is a healing remedy. We're going to reach out to areas where man has seemed to have difficulty. As we concentrate that the gifts of the Holy Spirit might function, let us believe. Let us believe. Sister Ingram, you're concerned about the losing losing of your sight. You've told me nothing about your condition. Is that no, correct? No, I haven't. You're not able to see me clearly. Things just blur to you. You have to stumble around lately through crowds and are not able to see even people's faces close up to you clearly. That's true. And 
I'm really grateful because without this church, without our Pastor Jim Jones to teach me the right way, I would not be in college right now. I wouldn't be having a, a wonderful, leading a life like I am because of Pastor Jim Jones. And how many of you in here have been healed of arthritis, cancer? How many of you in here? That's right, so many of you. We all, I'm grateful, and I know everyone else is here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And I began to lose control of my car, and I was traveling at a very, very fast rate of speed, 65 miles an hour. As I lost control, the tire blew out. And instantly, I thought of the Christ force of our pastor, Jim Jones, and a way was made. Thank you, Jesus. A way was made. I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be alive in this ministry that has done so much for me. Thank you. And so they came to Jones, and he provided what seemed to be a loving, integrated, hard-working Christian community. Why should they doubt him? After all, the church was a chartered member of a large mainline Christian denomination. The pastor was an ordained minister in good standing with that denomination. In fact, Jones was a celebrity well known throughout the area. Appointed by the mayor to head the San Francisco Housing Commission, elected foreman of the Mendocino County Grand Jury, a preacher whose worship services and community action programs inspired hope in the people. Why should they suspect they were being deceived? But they were. From interviews with ex-Temple members, we can piece together a partial picture of that long, slow, subtle process of their deception. First, he had to replace the old authorities in their lives with a new one, himself. Listen. Focus on me all you want. I owe something to my people, and that's to be a good pastor, and that I am, the best I am. Do you want to go out and tell them something that I stand for about social action, social justice? Ask me your questions, and I'll tell you right straight from the shoulder where I stand. And people view me in a myriad of ways. Some people see me as the representative of the I am, as Jehovah Jireh. Some people see a great deal of God in my body. They see Christ in me, a hope of glory. Peace. 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 And it does fabulous things. I could accept him saying that he was a prophet of God because I, he was a real good speaker. He was saying a lot of things that I felt. You know, he could, he could express for me things that I wanted to say, but I really didn't know how. Made me feel good to listen to him talk. He used to take the newspaper, and he'd read it to us, and then he would interpret it. And I'm sure it was slanted the way he wanted it to be. But that really, you know, I really sat up, because I want to learn. I've always wanted to learn. And so you believe it, and you join the church, and then whatever he tells you, you end up believing it. The more power that he got with people, the numbers of people, and the more money that he attained, the sicker he got, and the more he wanted. Jim wanted all allegiance for himself. He wanted every person to uh, only love him. When there's allegiance to one individual person, where this person is allowed to interpret God or interpret things for you, and you accept his thoughts more than your own, uh, I think that should be a warning sign. J Jim Jones became an authority figure for me, just like Jesus had in the past. I feel like Americans, especially young people today, they're too trusting. I think that oftentimes this goes back to early religious programming that says that you are not really capable of making the ultimate decisions for your life. You need a leader. Jones took advantage of their trusting and misused his authority in their lives. Who are the authority figures in your life? Do you just sit back and believe them? Or do you study and test and question on your own? A trustworthy authority will welcome your questions, even the hard ones. Jones didn't. Jones also abused intimacy. One thing that 
uh, Jim Jones did to us as uh, the years progressed was uh, to keep us isolated from each other. When we went to school, we were not allowed to communicate or be friends with anyone that was not in the group. Like we weren't allowed to see our parents, our old friends, and we weren't allowed to watch newspapers. All the people that are left, they weren't supposed to have any contact with the relatives that were inside the church. Jim Jones tried to cut you off. He said, your parents don't care for you. Your family doesn't care for you. Your relatives have turned their backs on you, which even though you didn't like the church that much, where else would you go? He even tried to, to divide families, uh, father against son, husband against wife. But most of the time, he'd have you living someplace else besides with your family. Well, he really didn't believe in the concept of the nuclear family. He believed that basically a nuclear family was a selfish institution because everybody in the world couldn't enjoy the nuclear family, so why should you? Say a mother has her child on her lap. Somebody, a counselor, will come over there and give her the works tell, and um, make, that, make her child go to someone, to, to a total stranger. And, um, and they said that it was making them independent. And he didn't want family ties. He didn't want anybody to be um, anybody else's father except for him. And of course, marriages posed a real problem to him in this because, uh, you know, your first allegiance was to your husband. So he said that uh, marriage alliances were counter-revolutionary. And he would get both of you upset with one another, and then he would bring you into your planning commission meeting, and then one of you would be set up. And he tried to have husbands and wives confront one another or, uh, in other words, say something against the partner publicly so that the partner would have to defend their actions. I said cruel things to Tim and Tim said very cruel things to me, but Jim Jones set us up. It was his divide and conquer method and it worked very well. I was willing, in a way, to say to myself, it's not right for me to enjoy all these beautiful qual feminine qualities about grace because in so doing it will detract distract me from the, from the fight to solve uh, social injustice problems in the world. We didn't allow ourselves to talk. And that's one thing that Jim Jones used and I think brought a lot of people, broke up a lot of marriages. And so I was willing to sort of go through this hell of living a very lonely type of existence and hope that Grace would someday understand. But I was wrong and she was right. We talked it over and we decided that as long as we stayed in the church, we would never stop talking. And then later, as Jim Jones started putting down very strict rules about sex, uh, my husband and I talked again and we decided that, you know, our marriage was the most important thing to us and we would never stop making love, we'd never stop communicating with one another, and also we never uh, confronted one another publicly. And because of this, we had a, an alliance that was able to help us keep our sanity through all those years when things were really insane. Jones also kept them isolated and lonely. With whom do you really share? What are you doing to preserve and nurture those relationships? What are you doing that might endanger those relationships? If you are feeling isolated and lonely and cut off, you are more ready to be deceived. Jones also misused their time. When we were in the temple, we gave all of our time to the cause. The workers, which I was one, got an average of four to maybe six hours sleep a night, occasionally six, but many nights no sleep. And we were constantly tired. And we were required to work a minimum of 16 hours a day and I would work anywhere from 16 to 18. And every Thursday night I would work all night long, you know, for over 24 hours. You go to your, the planning commission meetings and you stay up from, uh, from 9 o'clock in the evening until 7 o'clock next morning. You have to go right to a job or something or go back to school. Most of our members usually sitting in the junior choir with all the other kids, being in, most of the time falling asleep and then getting yelled at while I woke up which was around midnight, you know, they'd keep you, they'd keep you up even if you were a little kid until about at least one or two in the morning. But what, what was happening as I was be becoming so exhausted and tired, 
I'd start getting real nervous because, you know, my body would start shaking. And I used to fantasize about crawling on my hands and knees and begging Jim Jones just to let me go to sleep. You gave up desires for, like, to go to a movie or to get a new dress, things that an ordinary person would want. The only thing we really desired was to get a little sleep, to maybe have, an, you know, like a hamburger from McDonald's was a huge treat. These were the only thing we really wanted. That was our desires. We, we gave up big desires. Why'd you work so hard? For the cause. I mean, this was a group. This was my family. Jim Jones cared about me, and I wanted to do whatever he wanted me to do, and that's what he wanted me to do, was work hard. I got strokes for hard work. I got praise. And, you know, in a group where you don't get much of anything, praise from the leader means a great deal. Jones kept them exhausted. Time. Time for what? How do you use it? Does it leave you feeling refreshed, or it's so much easier to be deceived when you're empty and exhausted? Jones also abused discipline. Jim Jones took all the youth on a, a camping trip up to the Oregon border, California Oregon border, near Crescent City up there. And the main reason that Jim took us up there, he said, was to train us for survival in case there was ever a a nuclear holocaust or a, or a, a depression, uh, fascism takes over in our country. He told us that uh, the country was going to be taken over, be taken over by a fascist dictator, and that all blacks would be put in concentration camps, and all black sympathizers would be put in concentration camps, just like uh, Hitler did with the Jews. And he would uh, have these plays uh, or stage. Uh, the Klan running through the congregation and uh, have a simulated uh, hanging of a black person uh, in front of the congregation, firing guns at, at their head and with blanks and loud noises and uh, screaming and crying, you know. And Some young man was being disciplined for having drank wine and Jim says, well, every person in this organization should be whipped. So about 300 of us stood up, and each one of us got whipped three times with a belt. And it, and it really hurt. So afterwards, though, I, I thought, well, you know, you discipline children when they do something wrong. I discipline my children. I whip them if they've done something wrong. Maybe it's not so terrible to put ourselves on a level of childlike trust. This is my father. And therefore, if he's trying to teach me a lesson, I should accept that. Then the, the whippings got worse and worse. Uh, our daughter was beaten 75 times with a board. And I, it was very difficult to justify that. In fact, while she was being beaten, I hated Jim Jones. I wanted to leave that church. I wanted to take my children to a safe place. But afterwards, there was no accurate feedback. I couldn't come to anybody and say, wasn't that terrible? Because every person was saying what a beautiful thing it was. And even Linda, who had been beaten, was saying, now I really feel like I understand the rules of the church. And Jim Jones helped me a lot. Even as they were being whipped, temple members remember being grateful for a church that cared enough about them to confront them. Jones went way too far. But do you have anybody to keep you honest? Do you have anybody to whom you can confess? Anybody who will confront you and forgive you and help you start again? Jones also misused their money. In the early days, we didn't have any public offerings. It was just a, a commitment that people gave and, and it, in the early days, it was 25% of your gross income. Then he would have uh, multiple offerings, and then, then more or less threats, you know, like if so-and-so uh, had given $1,000, she wouldn't be dead today. She had a $1,000 uh, to give. Uh, so people would give thinking that uh, they were going to die if they, were, if they didn't give. When I got out here, um, my father had died and left us our social security, social security and that uh, 
when we got involved with the youth group, uh, they said that we had to turn off all our social security, that the church would pay for our way through school. And then he got people to turn over their property later on by using the uh, biblical quotation, uh, uh, give all things and have all things in common. Eventually, we all had to work during the summer, and we all had to turn in all of our money and everything so that, you know, what you had to live on is what the church wanted you to live on, what they give you in return. My wife and I gave 19 homes that we were buying in Willits to the church and two homes that we were buying in Redwood Valley to the church. Uh, they used uh, the fact that we were going to be missionaries to Africa as a means of getting us to sign over this property to the church. Uh, it ended up, uh, we didn't go to Africa, and then we were going to go to South, South America. We actually had our passports, our shots. Uh, we were going to leave the day, the very next day when he canceled it. We had learned Swahili, and then we in turn studied uh, Spanish because we were going to be going to South America. But then later we realized that this whole thing was just uh, a ploy to get us to turn over our property to the church. It, you know, it just got worse as time went. The, the bigger the congregation, the more demands that were put on people for uh, giving their offerings. What really bothers me is the poor black people that uh, maybe didn't have hardly anything and, and uh, turned over uh, some little precious item that they had, turned over their jewelry. And for them to get a start in life uh, would be very difficult. I mean, if, if Jones had had to let his books be audited, he would not have survived. Obviously, they found $26 million where people were starving in that church because we all thought we were poor. Jones kept them in a state of poverty and dependence. Money. How do we use our money? Crave it, hoard it, get cynical about giving it? No, they weren't wrong in giving it all away. The tragedy was it never ended up in its intended destination, and they were too trusting to check. There were a lot of things the people in these pews didn't check. There were a lot of questions they didn't ask, and that's why so few of them escaped, why so many stayed so long, and why most of them ended up in Jonestown. I stayed as long as I did because I believed that basically he was right that we were doing the right thing even though there were contradictions and strange things going on in the church there was no other group where uh there was anything happening there were so many good things that i saw going on it was still my family even though there were things in this family that i didn't like it was still my family he never did anything drastic but you realized after a year that you'd gone through a lot of changes. It was just like the sadism, the beatings. Uh, everything came about gradually so that you were able to put up with a, it as it went along, you know, because it didn't seem so bad at first. And you saw that and you'd say to yourself, well, look, maybe the problem is in me. Maybe it's because I'm too bourgeois. Maybe I'm too selfish. I need privacy more than I ought to. I should be willing to give myself uh, to the cause and recognize that life is to be endured, not to be enjoyed, so I'll stick it out. In 1975, the beatings had escalated to the point that it was just nauseating to be in a service, uh, having to listen to children scream hour after hour, and the punishments had gotten just bizarre beyond belief. Little children being electric shocked and, and having to stand for hours on a wall ledge. And He'd have... Um Everybody drink a cup of uh, supposedly wine or something, and he said afterwards um, he would just drink some poison. Ha 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 ha! You know, you only have a half an hour left to live. So he shook his fist up to God. He says, "If there's a God in heaven, let him strike me dead." You were so mixed up at that point that you know you didn't know if you were coming or going, and so. Yeah, I suddenly realized this is not a commune, this is not a church, this is just insanity. And I acknowledge my mistake. I mean, I was a fool 
to join this organization and to commit so much of my will to it. And it's not pleasant to call yourself a fool, but all you can say is that uh, you don't have to remain one forever. We talked it over with our children, explained to them that we were going to be quitting the church. Once you enter people's temple, you don't leave, or you don't leave very easily, because there were death threats, there was a lot of pressure from the congregation, and they said, well, Mom and Dad, we love you very much, and we just hope that when you do decide to quit the church, you move far away so we aren't the ones assigned to kill you. And these two girls were 16 at the time, and this is how thoroughly brainwashed we were. You couldn't convince anybody to leave. It, it had to be an individual decision inside yourself. And I simply spun on my heel and ran with my child out, got into my car, and he was, he was yelling my name as I left. Uh, he proceeded to call me. He told me that there would be an accident in which all three of us would be killed. So that's, that's the commitment that we all made when we finally decided to leave, that okay, we'll be killed for this, we'll probably be shot in the middle of the night or bombed or something, but it's better than going back. But I feel that, that Jim at one time knew God, and he chose to go his own way as opposed to God's way, and, uh, and this is where it brought him. Jones never loved anyone as the picture was presented. He'd only help the community where he saw it was pulling him politically, involvement, you know, getting, gain more power. He only, he only used people. People were pawns. They really didn't know Jim Jones. They saw the Jim Jones on the podium, and they saw the Jim Jones when he would come and embrace them and talk to them, and, you know, really, he was their pal. Later, we realized that the real love in the group was the people. The people were very loving people. They were conscious of, of the uh, suffering in the world, the inequities, and they're very sensitive people. They didn't see the real Jim Jones. And so, consequently, they were, I call it, tricked into going to Guyana. Once they got there, they had no real means of leaving. And that's why it was so so uh, traumatic to us here at the Human Freedom Center as we watched on the television all the people that had died down there. Yeah, I think we had finally accepted the fact that this was going to happen. We had told every person we could find. We had gone to every agency. We would sent documents, affidavits. We had called people pleading for help. And we finally had just realized there is nobody that cares, there is no one that's going to help us, there is nothing we can do, and at that point we accepted the fact that these people were doomed. It was excruciating pain for us, the people that lived in our homes, you know, we thought of as, as our family, and uh, it was just so sad. pictures you have just seen were the last ever taken on that last day in Jonestown. Greg Robinson, the San Francisco Examiner photographer who took them, was shot and killed with this unfinished roll still on his camera. We want to forget that whole ugly story, especially how it ended. Lou Gervich is one who will not forget. His daughter Jan was one of Jones' victims. She grew up in New Orleans, much loved, protected, in a neighborhood of quiet southern gentility. She attended a private school near her home, then on to Tulane University, Vassar, 
and Berkeley, where she joined the People's Temple. Her father, Lou Gervich, a New Orleans businessman, says his daughter was bright, caring, full of cheer. Jan loved children. She taught social studies to the 219 children murdered in Jonestown. When asked why Jan went to Guyana, her father answered, She wanted to do something. She didn't like the world the way it was. And to tell you the truth, I admire her for it. And she did something. And unfortunately, it turned out to be the ghastliest mistake ever made. Lou Gervich was in Guyana, struggling to make contact with his daughter when word of death in Jonestown reached him. He begged helicopter crews to let him fly with them to the scene, hoping his daughter would not be among the dead, hoping it was not too late to rescue her. The following morning, we were still in Matthews Ridge, and the parrots came flying across. And the jungle became alive, and we were up there very early so we could catch the copter out to Kaituma and get there before the government picked up the bodies. I initially hated the place, and somewhere in the four miles between Fort Kaituma and Jonestown, I switched and I suddenly wanted it to be nice. And it was from the air. Every furrow was well done. They had learned to farm reasonably well. The crops were harvested, uh, and uh, I was pleased uh, for my daughter's sake. You could understand now why someone could be influenced, how with the beauty of the jungle and the fact that it was orderly, and if you had some friends down there, and if they thought like you did, you wouldn't be doing much harm and might even be helping certain people. And then uh, we landed, and I asked the soldier where the bodies were, and he pointed, and it was about, I guess, 200 yards. And then from the pleasant atmosphere that you had felt from the air about Jonestown, it turned into a charnel house. And then, I guess it was the worst thing ever happened to me, and they had a casualty list. It's five pages long, and my daughter wasn't on the first four pages. She was on the fifth. I swear to God, I just can't get out of this. I felt new from the way the circumstances came about that I knew my daughter was dead. And I had to know why. What was she doing here? And so I did everything I could. And I ran into a situation that is the closest resemblance to what I've, my concept of hell that I've ever seen. Will we forget our brothers and sisters who were deceived? Will we forget the questions that they have raised for us? Questions about the poor and needy who came here to Jones because no one else seemed to care. Questions about those who were anxious to work for justice and equality and came to Jones because at least he provided them practical, exciting ways to help others. Questions about authority figures, the Christian celebrities and heroes in our lives and how dangerous it is for us and for them to sit back and listen and believe unquestioningly. Questions about time and about how easy it is to be deceived when we're always busy, always tired. Questions about those few intimate relationships that we have with a husband or wife, with family or friends, what we're doing to strengthen them and what we're doing that might undermine those relationships and leave us lonely and vulnerable. Questions about the money we give and how seldom we check to see that it ends up where we intended. Questions about church discipline and how difficult it is for us to question and confront each other when we might be falling prey to temptation and before it is too late. Questions about deception and how subtly 
and easily our Christian brothers and sisters were deceived. We want to forget Jonestown and the people who died there. We cling to God's promises. Fear not, little children. My grace is sufficient. I have overcome the evil one. And we should remember the promises and believe them. But we must remember God's warnings in his word as well. Jesus said, false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. The Apostle Paul wrote, see to it that no one makes a prey of you by philosophy and empty deceit. Several of the New Testament authors wrote, be not deceived. And that brings us back to the question with which I started this project. Could it happen to me? Could someone I love be deceived? I wish there were an easy answer. There isn't. We, we are asked to live somewhere between God's promises and God's warnings. Believe his promises. Depend upon God's spirit, upon his word, upon his people. But don't forget the warnings. The price of forgetting them is just too great. Tim and Grace Stone lost their marriage to Jones and their only son, John Victor, age six, in Jonestown. Bonnie Thielman lost her marriage to Jones and her much-loved second family in the jungle. Al Mills lost the work of a lifetime and Jean and Al both lost hundreds of close friends and co-workers in the tragedy. Lena lost her mother, her stepfather, her sister, her cousins, and nieces in Guyana. Wayne lost his youngest brother, age 12, his stepfather, his cousin, his in-laws, and hundreds of friends. Daphine Mills lost the members of the children's choir and most of her friends from childhood. Lou Gervich lost his daughter. Protesting the conditions of an inhumane war. 